This is Earl Nightingale with the first issue of Direct Line. The purpose of this new program is to explore ideas, the best ideas from the past and present as they pertain to you and me and the mystery of our lives. Ideas about people, why they do the things they do, and why they don't do some of the things they could do. Why they live the way they do, believe the way they do, work and play the way they do. Our most distinguished and eloquent researchers in the field of psychology and psychiatry tell us that our affluent society has not brought us happiness and joy. On the contrary, people in the highly developed, wealthy nations of the world seem to be suffering from a malaise made up of boredom, apathy, and general depression. Now, we know that people are at their best, that is, they seem to be happiest and most energetic, when they're striving toward the fulfillment of what seems to them to be good and worthy ideas. Isn't that true? People move mountains and dance and sing far into the night when they're swept up by a great idea. There's something about the human creature that makes him godlike when he's moved by a great idea and apathetic, bored, and depressed when he's not. Wherever you find boredom, you'll find the absence of a good idea in a child or an adult. People are depressed and bored when they know deep down in the very fibers of their being that the life they're living is not what it could be, not what it ought to be. We suffer from an all-pervading feeling of guilt when we're living below our true capacities in our work and in our play. And it's beginning to dawn upon the people everywhere that we've been chasing a mistaken concept of what success is all about. We've confused means with ends. We'll find success, each of us, in his own way, when we find ourselves. And when we do, all things that we want and need will be added to our lives. The journey of self-discovery, the journey into meaning, is the most exciting on earth and the most rewarding. When we're gripped by a good idea, a succession of good ideas, really, because one leads to another, we're at our best, our happiest. We may not know that we're happy, but we are, and our lives are characterized by a feeling of worth, of purpose. Ideas bring the fresh, clean air of renewal into our lives, into our home lives, into our business lives. The real fun of life is in continually bridging the gap which lies between where we are and where we want to be, and from what we are to what we wish to become. There are three main departments of living with which we should concern ourselves and in which we should succeed. They are, number one, our family lives. Number two, the way we spend our days, on the job and off. And number three, our income. The purpose of this program is to help us find more meaning, more real success in each of these vital departments. First, just a word about listening. You know, when we listen, and especially the information that involves us personally, our minds only pay attention to what we're hearing until something we hear triggers an idea in our minds. Now, at that instant, our minds tune out and concentrate on the new thought. It's like lifting the tone arm on a record player. We no longer hear anything, but the record keeps turning. Now, when you hear something in direct line that sparks an idea, you tune me out for whatever time you devote to the idea. You'll do this repeatedly. The next time you listen, you'll tune out at different times. Because of the way we listen and because our attention will dart from what we're hearing to what we're thinking about, it's necessary to hear a spoken message several times just to hear it for the first time. And even weeks, months, or years later, it will spark new ideas. So if it's convenient, stop the player whenever you want to think about something you hear. Perhaps you want to make a note of what you've heard or think about it for some time. Then, when you're ready to resume, start the player again and so on. If you're driving your car or if the whole family's listening, that might not be practicable. But even with stops and starts, repeated listening is necessary to make what you hear a part of your way of thinking and doing things. Unfortunately, we don't learn much from something we read only once. If it were printed, it would take time away from other things. In audio form, it can be listened to while we're doing other things, such as commuting to and from work, while traveling on business calls, while dressing, having breakfast, while relaxing after a long day, and so on. Moreover, in this form, it can be heard by all members of the family. If it were only in printed form, it's unlikely that it would be read by more than one, two at most. Another important reason for the cassette tape is that listening is our most effective and effortless way of obtaining information, the most natural way to learn anything. We learned by listening for many years as children before we learned to read. You see, we pluck ideas from speech as we might catch fish from a flowing river. We're not even conscious of the words being used. We listen for ideas. 
And that's what this program is all about. We learn to read by listening. And for most, reading remains something of a mechanical process from which ideas must be constructed. And finally, the spoken word carries so much more interest and flavor, so much more meaning, and an emotional impact impossible with the printed word. Well, let's begin with this great thought. It has appeared in many forms in man's literature, but I believe it was Emerson who put it best. Nature magically suits the man to his fortunes by making these the fruit of his character. We might experience some difficulty in finding out what we're really like by trying to look inward, but we have only to look about us at our fortunes, for they are the fruit of our character. The late Dr. Maslow, former president of the American Psychological Association, said you judge a person the same way you judge an apple tree, by his fruit, by what he produces. Do you go along with that? It's hard not to, isn't it? Well, what is character? My random house on a bridge says character is the aggregate of features and traits that form the apparent individual nature of some person or thing. My Oxford English Dictionary gives us its first definition, a distinctive mark, impressed, engraved, or otherwise formed, a brand, a stamp. Any person who has had the chance to live as an adult for any appreciable length of time begins to collect about him what we can call his fortunes. They represent a merciless mirror of him as a person. They reflect his nature and constitute, in total, a distinctive mark, a brand, a stamp. Just as you can tell the name of a fruit tree by examining its fruit, you can tell a great deal about a person in the same way. And we can tell a great deal about ourselves. We surround ourselves in an environment, in circumstances, as Professor Jose Ortega y Gasset used the word, which reflect us and which include our true beliefs. No matter how loudly we talk about what we believe in, our circumstances reflect our true beliefs. They show to others what is important to us. They reflect our degree of maturity at any given stage of our lives. You see, our fortunes are simply the sum total of what we want and believe we are qualified to receive at any given stage of our lives. For our fortunes should change. They should not just accumulate as we get older. They should change in quality. Change to reflect the changing person. If they do not change, it is an indication that we are not changing. If they do not grow in quality, it's an indication that we are not growing and maturing as persons. Our fortunes are the fruit of our character, and our character changes. Someone once said to Dr. Robert Hutchins when he was chancellor of the University of Chicago with regard to adult education that you can't teach old dogs new tricks. To which Dr. Hutchins replied, human beings are not dogs and education is not a bag of tricks. We can grow through knowledge with good ideas. And as we grow, our worlds will change to reflect our growth. We outgrow our old selves and shake them off like stiff cocoons, no longer big enough to contain us. And that's as it should be. That's the way a person, a family, an organization of any kind should grow. We might say that a person, or an organization, will grow in proportion to two main conditions. The first concerns his degree of receptivity. Are his windows open to the fresh breeze of renewal in the form of new ideas and creative thinking? Many persons, you know, in organizations are closed systems. They've got their windows closed and locked, apparently in the belief that they're already the repository of all useful information. We can all name such persons and such organizations, some quite large, but shrinking. The one thing that always typifies a closed system is that it ultimately begins to shrink, and it will eventually die if it stays closed long enough. Any person or persons making up the management of any sort of organization who feel no need for new ideas or who do not challenge their own beliefs from time to time, are on the road down towards stagnation and decay. And the second condition governing a person's or organization's growth will be determined by the source or sources of ideas. Now, if our ideas come to us only from those by whom we're habitually surrounded, those who live much as we do, we tend to do little more than reiterate and fortify the ideas we already live by. That's also true in an organizational sense. A person can be said to be an organization, indeed a highly complex organization. Like any other sort of organization, the overall success will be determined by the quality of management. Just as the success of any business or other organization depends for its success or failure upon its management, so does the success or failure of a person depend upon the way he manages himself. 
We're all units of production. We produce things and words and attitudes which reflect our management. And the quality of our product, our total product, will be determined by the quality of our own self-management. Now, we can determine the quality of our overall product by simply assessing what we're being paid for it. It's true for a person, or for a business firm, or any sort of organization. And we might say the quality of our management will be determined by the quality of our ideas. The main ideas of our lives are the main roads on which we travel. So where do we get most of our ideas? When you ask about the extent of a person's education, you must ask, who were his teachers? We need to ask ourselves the same question. We can change. We can grow. And as we change and grow, our fortunes will reflect that change and growth. That our character is the architect of our fortunes is an interesting idea, isn't it? It's so interesting that it could bring about a significant change in our way of living. It could modify or completely change our goals in life. It gives us a way of assessing the quality and the importance of the product we're producing in each of our important divisions. Let's say a company has three divisions. Two are doing well, one is losing money. Now, the one that's losing money, provided it's been losing money for some time, would seem to indicate that it has poor management or else it produces a product or service without sufficient demand on the part of those it would serve. Now, the same can be said to be true of the different departments of our lives. Quite often a person will be great in one department and poor in another, great on the job and here living perhaps, but poor at home, or great at home and poor on the job. I think we can safely say that every relatively normal person wants to succeed in each of the three main departments of living, in his family life, in the way he spends his days, that is, the work he's chosen and the way he chooses to spend his free time. It's surprising, you know, how many people tend to forget that they chose their work of their own free will, just as they chose their spouses of their own free will, and the main direction of their lives of their own free will. And we all want to succeed in the income department. That is, we want an income sufficient to fulfill our wants, not just our needs, but our wants as well. Now, we control our rewards in each of these departments. If we've been adults for any real length of time, and if we've achieved any real maturity, we must admit to ourselves that our rewards in each department are commensurate with our management, with our success in interacting with those upon whom our success depends. Now, that's an idea we will accept or reject, depending upon whether our windows are open or closed. I mentioned earlier that we often confuse means with ends. For example, an automobile is a means to an end. It's a means of getting from point A to point B. Money is a means to an end. It's the means to the kind of life we want to live. It represents financial security now and in our later years. It represents good health, education, travel, a good home, and so forth. Now, in our society, these means to ends and others have often been confused with ends. The automobile or money in itself has become an object of veneration, not for what it will do for us to make life more convenient and more pleasurable, but rather for what it is in itself. We tend to worship objects in our society. And finally, we find ourselves in possession of all the objects we ever wanted, and we stand in the middle of them and look at them and come to the realization that they're not enough, not nearly enough. A human being needs more, much more than a pile of objects, important as some of them are. And that's one of the reasons we find so much depression, so much boredom and apathy about us. People have what they wanted. Why aren't they happy? Could it be that they've not moved on to other larger and more worthwhile goals? I think so. George Bernard Shaw said that it is the first duty of every man not to be poor. And I agree with that. Poverty has never bought happiness. We see it staring from the hunger-ravaged faces of the world's underprivileged. We see it in our ghettos. But there are two kinds of income, psychic and tangible. The psychic income is the income of the mind and feelings, the kind we get when we look at our loved ones or when we've done a good job. Psychic income is the income the firemen get roaring through town with the sirens screaming. It's the income a police officer knows when he straps on his revolver and assumes the authority of his uniform. There's psychic income that comes with a promotion, with the executive suite. It's excitement and satisfaction, and it's perhaps the most important income we receive from our life's work. We can make a living, we can get rich doing many things, but psychic riches come from being in the kind of work we like, doing the things we want to do. Conrad Lorenz, in his excellent book, On Aggression, tells us that the drive to fulfill oneself, 
to realize, if possible, the potential of one's unique endowment is coded in our genetic instructions. And it's going contrary to our genetic instructions that causes us anxiety, guilt. We seem to know that there's a way to live that's better than the one we're settling for. Now, family, school, society all work to fit us into established pigeonholes. And for some, it's fine. For others, the shoe doesn't fit. It hurts. It rubs and chafes and can become agonizingly painful. No psychic income there. So those must seek it off the job in hobbies and avocations or change the job. But we need to get it somewhere. Psychic income is an important part of our income picture. As to financial income, it should meet our requirements. What those requirements are is a matter of individual taste. Our income should be sufficient for us to live in the style we most enjoy, have the things we think are important, do the things we want to do, see the places we want to see, and perhaps help others who didn't manage or couldn't manage to work it out for themselves. In a society such as ours, it can be said that not every person can find the kind of gainful employment that forms a perfect fit with his aptitudes, likes, and dislikes. Many factors work to hold a person in a particular place and at a particular job other than the amiability of the job itself. But I do believe that almost every thinking, growing, maturing person can find the work he enjoys. And for the rest, the deep sources of satisfaction and interest can come from experiences not connected with their work. For some, their work is the very mainstay of their lives. For others, it's simply the means to an end. Many people are quite content to not work at all. Most retired people enjoy their retirement and wouldn't change things for the world. But for some, active, mind-engaging work is as necessary as food and drink. For many women, running a home, raising their children, caring for their husbands, and a thousand and one things necessary to that life are more than enough for all the satisfaction they need. They're quite content with their lives, as they should be. For other women, such a life is unthinkable, the way to madness. They need other interests, other lives. To expect that 50% of the human race should be content with keeping house and raising a family is ridiculous. It's as ridiculous as it would be to expect all men to be lawyers or bricklayers. A woman can want the love and companionship of a man and perhaps a family without at the same time having an aptitude or even an interest in keeping house. She might prefer to be a brain surgeon, a teacher, a business executive, or any one of the 200,000 possible occupations in our society. We've been taught to live within our means. And it's good advice for a company, a country, or a person. But what are our means? Have we explored our means? Do we know what our real means are? People say a person shouldn't reach beyond his capacity. It'll only end in frustration and disappointment. What is a person's capacity? How is he to find out what it is unless he reaches? The man and wife in the so-called average home on an average street in an average town haven't the faintest notion as a rule that they can sit down at the kitchen table, make a list of everything they want, number the items on the list in the order of their importance to them, and then get everything on that list in five years, certainly in ten. An American labor leader once commented that the American people can have anything they want. The trouble is that they don't know what they want, and this most certainly applies to income. A British survey team discovered that the average American family believes that happiness can be guaranteed with a 20% increase in income. It's obvious that most people haven't the foggiest notion as to what constitutes happiness. How does a person increase his income to the point where it more comfortably meets his needs, his present needs, and his savings and investment needs for the future? A good first step is to realize that everything we want, other people have, and will give us if we earn it. One dollar from just 10% of the families in the United States would come to seven million dollars. Our income is in the hands of others. If our income is not what we want it to be, we must examine our product and our management. We have failed to qualify for it or have lacked the courage and ideas to go after it. Thoreau said, We have only to move confidently in the direction of our dreams to meet with a success unexpected in common hours. Interesting idea, isn't it? There's an exciting renewing idea. We have only to move confidently in the direction of our dreams to meet with a success unexpected in common hours. The direction of our dreams is often nothing more than our genetic instructions, than our subconscious, our natural propensities, whatever we want to call it, trying to point us in the right direction. The minute we begin to move in the direction that's right for us, things start going our way. We begin to get lucky, as they say. So we need to ask ourselves, Am I moving in the direction of my dreams? 
Or am I playing lockstep with millions of other people because of some stereotyped idea I picked up from people who don't know any more than I do, maybe less? People who perhaps have not proved in their own lives that they're experts when it comes to living successfully. Eric Hoffer put it pretty well when he said, We're taught not to waste time and raised to waste our lives. Something to think about. So a person, standing back and assessing the three main departments of his life, and understanding that his fortunes are the fruit of his character, gets a pretty good look at himself as manager of himself and whatever else he manages. I think, too, that it's a good idea to reassess our priorities from time to time. What is really important and what isn't? The mature person has this question pretty well straight in his mind. His goals, his needs, are his own. They do not necessarily mirror those of the majority of other people. I think we'd be safe to say that with the mature person, his goals and what he considers to be important in his life will not be those held by the majority. The fact that he has goals sets him apart. Recent research into the modern plague of cardiovascular disease with millions dying of heart disease years before they should has turned up convincing evidence that we're bringing heart disease upon ourselves because of our lifestyle, our penchant for speed, speed simply for speed's sake, by our impatience of delay, by our headlong rush toward what? Where? Where are we going? What's the hurry? The maturing person agrees with the great Swiss psychologist and psychiatrist Carl Jung, who said, The supreme goal of man is to fulfill himself as a creative, unique individual according to his own innate potentialities and within the limits of reality. And we can do that without a headlong frenetic charge. You know, when we study golf under a good instructor, we're amazed to learn that an easy, slow, rhythmical swing gets the best results in direction and distance. As my good friend Julius Burroughs says, swing easy, but hit hard. It's the same in tennis, any sport. It's balance. It's rhythm. My good friend Herb True dropped in the office the other day and said, you know, we Catholics are on the birth control bandwagon, too. It's just that we're in the rhythm section. It's good to remember where our businesses are concerned where our lives are concerned. It's quality and balance. It's living in balance that counts, that gets the best results, always. We'll live longer and in better health, do better, and enjoy it more. Unless we're doing piecework, it isn't the time we put in, it's the ideas we get and put to work. Everything we see about us that's man-made was once an idea in the mind of one person. Our ideas can be just as good. It takes maturity to realize that as a rule, happiness and contentment do not come when we reach our goals. We're amazed to find that we were happier, more contented when we were striving toward them. I remember reading a comment by a New York University professor that went something to the effect that while dissatisfaction may be uncomfortable, the real disasters in life occur when we get what we want. He was referring to some of the larger goals of society, but the same thing often applies to us as persons. When we stop striving toward something new, something we find worthwhile and interesting, we begin to die. It's believed that's why teachers, scientists, writers, philosophers, farmers, and others who constantly have something new to look forward to tend to live such long, healthy lives. The teacher has a new class every year. The scientist is always working on a new, tough problem. The writer has a new book or article to do. The philosopher is forever uncovering new, interesting information, fresh ideas. And the farmer has the renewal of new crops and animals about him, a new season to work toward. Many others fit into the same category. Those who do not tend to live shorter lives. With no new place to go, they simply stop sooner. A generalization, of course, but it tends to work out. Incidentally, heart attacks, contrary to popular opinion, are not common among leaders in business and industry, in government and education. The leaders usually enjoy excellent health and have learned to live in balance. It's the people in the levels below the top who permit themselves to be skimmed off years before their time. It's been said that a heart attack is nature's way of telling us to slow down or change our habits, or both. It's a rude lesson, often fatal, but that's nature's way. How did Huxley put it? He compared living to playing a game of chess with an invisible opponent who's always strictly fair and just, but who never overlooks a mistake. If we play ill, he said, we are checkmated, without haste, but without remorse. And to those who play well, they're rewarded with the overflowing generosity with which the strong delight in strength. Living in balance, in anything, is the way to play the game well. 
How did James Allen put it? A calm, strong life is like a shade-giving tree in a thirsty land, a sheltering rock in a storm. You know, it's only when we're calm and at peace with ourselves that the good ideas tend to come. I think that's why we so often get our best ideas early in the morning or while doing something that's totally routine, such as shaving, showering, driving the car, or walking alone. Most people do not do much creative thinking, you know. In fact, they've been put down so many times as youngsters, they've learned to distrust their own ideas, doubt their own ability to get worthwhile ideas. Our mind, and no one knows what the mind is, incidentally, or even where it is, the ancient Greeks thought for a while it was located in the liver. Our mind comes as standard equipment at birth. But since the demands put upon it are relatively small and it's not required to come up with new ideas, it soon falls into disuse. As with anything else, what we don't use, we tend to lose. And so it's easy to forget or never learn that we own free and clear the most amazing agency ever to appear on earth, the human mind, all of it, whatever it is, subconscious and conscious, seeming to draw as it does on the mysterious stuff of the universe, past and present. You know, there's a system for creative thinking, perhaps you're familiar with it. First, you define the problem. Put it on paper. Quite often, just defining it leads to a solution. The next step is to begin gathering data with regard to the idea. We need to find out all we can about the possible ways in which such an idea might be solved. We need to read about it, talk to people who've had similar problems, find out all we can about it. Next, we need to write down possible solutions. Think about possible solutions. Turn the problem every way but loose. Worry it like a puppy with a slipper. If it has to do with a product, can it be made larger, smaller, a different shape or color, simpler? You know, it's generally believed that in order to produce a product of excellent quality, it must cost more. The old dichotomy still hangs on the idea that if something is inexpensive, it must not be of the highest quality. Well, that's ridiculous. It can be inexpensive and still be of excellent quality. Think in terms of simplification. Can the superfluous be taken away? Sometimes a superior product must cost more because of the quality of its components and manufacture, but not necessarily. Since World War II, we've seen some excellent products turned out at very reasonable cost. After you've thought about it until you begin to dream about it and talk to yourself about it, then forget it. Let it slip down into the great cooker of your subconscious mind where the archetypes of your racial memory and your genetic wizardry and ten million ancestors can all work on it and hold it up against a thousand solutions. The mind is like a supercomputer. It'll work on a problem while we're doing other things. Let it cook as long as it needs to, and then one bright morning, if you're like I am, it'll usually wake you up at about four in the morning. The answer will pop into your mind as clear and simple and perfect as anything you ever saw in your life. You then yell Eureka, leap out of bed, and write the answer down on a piece of paper as fast as you can. If you don't, the idea can slip away as quietly and mysteriously as it came, and you can spend the next twenty years trying to recall it. The next step is to put the solution to work and stay with it to completion. Don't try to play it too safe. Nobody ever got to second base trying to keep one foot on first. Either you have confidence in your ideas or you don't. Getting good ideas is only about 10% of the job. The 90% is the follow-through. The person who will follow a good idea through to completion is one of the most valuable people in our society. Every problem is an opportunity. Our opportunities are an exact ratio to our problems. We have great national problems. Therefore, we have correspondingly great national opportunities. The bigger the problem, the better the opportunity. Problem, pollution. Great industries employing many hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people, will be built upon the problems of air, land, noise, and water pollution. Problem, population. Population means people. And whether you're serving their growing needs or helping them to hold their numbers in check, you've got opportunities. Millions are already being earned in these problem areas. There seem to be two main classifications of people in the world, the big group, which is made up of those who are part of the problem, and the small group made up of those who are part of the answers. Which group we choose to be in is up to us. A professor at MIT has said, The changes taking place in the world today are not merely changes from one form of society, one form of technology to another. They're so wide-sweeping that they're taking us from one major epoch of human history into another. We are in an order of change which is completely different from anything our ancestors knew, unless we go back 10,000 years when they invented property, ownership, work and mechanics based on the wheel. Change. Unprecedented, amazing change, and you and I are right in the middle of it. For some, change represents a threat to the status quo. For others, it represents unprecedented opportunity. For me, and I hope for you, change always represents new opportunities for growth, development, for the setting of new goals, for the moving on to new vistas, for the fresh breath of renewal. 
We don't know much about anything, really, but most of the top people in the disciplines touching on human conduct seem to be certain of two major points. One, the average healthy person functions at a fraction of his true capacity. And two, that the most exciting lifelong adventure is bringing more of our real powers to bear in our lives.